And I wanted to start a series with you on a little book toward the end of the New Testament called 1 John. In the back of your Bible, you'll find 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. This is the same man who wrote Revelation, wrote the Gospel of John. He's going to write 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And I want to go to chapter 5 in 1st John, and I want to spend several weeks talking to you about some encouraging thoughts out of this little book. There is a statement that's going to appear several times in this chapter, and each time it appears, it holds great significance for you as a Christian person or a person seeking a relationship with Jesus in the 21st century. We live in a world that is filled with uncertainty and doubt. Nobody knows what's going to happen today. Nobody has an assurance of what tomorrow will hold. We live in a world where everybody would admit that we don't have assurances and that there are doubts, that people are desperately seeking assurances. That's why when you go to buy a new car, they give you a 10-year, 100,000-mile warranty because they want to give you an assurance that it's going to be okay. Now, please notice what they're not saying to you. If you buy this car, it'll never break down. They're not saying that. They're saying to you, we guarantee you, this car is going to break down. But (laughs) we're going to be right there next to you up to a point. Ten years, 100,000 miles, we will assure you that we will help you. There's uncertainty in every aspect of life. None of us like that. None of us feel good about what we're not sure about. And that's why we buy insurance. We buy life insurance so that if something happens to us, our spouse will have more money than they ever had while we were alive. (laughs) They will live a life that we only dreamed of simply because we died and got out of the way. We don't know for sure what's going on inside of our bodies, and so we buy health insurance. We buy car insurance. Unemployment, I mean, um, employment has become an uncertainty. Unemployment has become a certainty for many. And for that reason, people crowd in and they buy unemployment insurance. Much of our money, much of an average budget goes to the topic of providing assurance for our lives and for our homes. We purchase protection for something that hasn't even happened yet just because we want to be assured that in case it does, we'll be okay. In 1 John chapter 5, there is a picture of a victorious life, a life that is lived by a person who is assured, a life that is lived by a person who is confident, a person who walks in security. A person who is assured that regardless of what happens, everything is going to be all right. Confidence, security, assurance, all of these things destroy worry in our lives. All of these three things, confidence, security, assurance, destroy fear in our life. These are the characteristics that dismantle anxiety from our lives. And I want to remind you that Jesus told you not to worry. He told you not to be afraid on several occasions. Well, how do we fight worry? How do we fight anxiety? How do we fight fear? We're going to talk about a lot of characteristics in this chapter that destroy those things by assurance. In this chapter, this, there's two little words that keep showing up over and over again. We know. We know. In verse 2, the word know in the Greek is genoskomen. It means to know, to become aware of something, to perceive it, or to understand it. In verses 13 through 20, the word we know is oda, oda. And it means to know fully, to understand, to recognize. This little thought of we know appears several times throughout this chapter. And it refers to a positive, absolute knowledge. It's a guarantee to you outside the human realm about your life and about your relationship with Jesus, some assurances for you. In a day and an age where most people are saying out loud to themselves or to others, 
I just don't know. This is going on, this is going on, this is going on, and you know what, Pastor? I just don't know. You, as a Christian, have a right to know a lot of things, and you should not be one who's walking around with your hands in the air saying, I just don't know. In a time of uncertainty, 1 John chapter 5 is all about certainty. We know. It's not just about an intellectual acknowledgement of something. It's an action-altering knowledge. It means that I know, so I do. It means that what I truly know creates the do in my life. In fact, how you behave today is a reflection of what you know and what you don't know. The way you conduct your life, the way you conduct yourself, the way you conduct your affairs, the way you conduct your relationships are all a reflection of what you know and what you don't know. We know. There are truths that give you the benefit of, not, of knowing. Not guessing, not hoping, but assurance of knowing is yours. This confidence is created by focusing on what you know and not focusing on what you don't know. Insecurity in your faith, insecurity in your life, insecurity in your walk with Jesus is always created when you repeat and focus on things you don't know. That's why many of you won't share your faith with anybody, because you're scared to death that somebody will ask you a question about something you don't know about. And instead of telling them what you do know, instead of telling them what has happened to you and what you are assured of, you just say nothing because you're afraid they might ask you a question that you would have to say, I don't know. Insecurity will always affect how you conduct your life. And if you start to focus on things that you're confident about and assured of, that'll change you too. You can know. This series is designed to reiterate some things that we should know. In the fifth chapter, seven times, John records these words, we know. Each of them provide assurance. And we need to know these we know statements. As a matter of fact, when it comes to we know in 1 John chapter 5, we need to be know-it-alls. Now, as some of you saw the series title, Know-It-All, and you thought I was preaching about you today. Because you just know everything, don't you? Praise the Lord for you. Every situation, you've got the answer. That's not what we're preaching about. We're talking about these we know statements and that you need to become an authority, an expert, and know it all on these things. The Bible describes you in many different ways as a believer. In Acts eleven twenty six, you're called a Christian, like Christ, a little Christ. In John 1, verse 12, you're called children of God. Ephesians 5, children of the light. In 1 Thessalonians 5, sons of the day. In 1 Peter 1.14, obedient children. And in 1 John chapter 5, in the beginning of this, in verse 4, you are called an overcomer. Overcomer. It says this in verse 4 of 1 John chapter 5, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Overcomer. What a tremendous term. What a great promise that has been spoken over you and your life. What a great thing for you to remember. The Bible refers to you, my friend, as an overcomer. You don't have to live a life where you're beaten up. You don't have to live a life where you're afraid. You don't have to live a life where you're, a life where you're tentative. You don't have to go through life with a victim mentality. The Bible says that you are an overcomer. Praise the Lord for that. The Greek word here is nikeo, and it means to conquer, to have victory. The Greek goddess for victory was a lady named Nike, where we get a word that is very common in our vernacular in the 21st century, Nike, victory, conqueror. We see Jesus using this word in his ministry in John 16, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, 
but take heart, I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. It's a statement of victory. Jesus is saying, I have victory. I have conquered. I have overcome the world system. Christian, you are in Christ. And you are privileged to partake in everything that Jesus is and everything that Jesus has. Including his righteousness. Including his inheritance. Including his death. Including his life. And since Christ is a victor, so are you, overcomer. You are a, vi- you are a victor. In John chapter 5, the topic of a victorious, overcoming kind of an existence is discussed. And in the New Testament, the word overcomer is used 24 separate times. 21 of them are found in John's writings. This is a significant ministry theme in this man's life. In John 5, there are five characteristics of the overcomer that are discussed. They're identified. 1 John 5, 1, saving faith. There is a faith that will save you from your sin and will take care of your eternity. It's a characteristic of an overcomer. In 1 John 5, 2, one of the characteristics of an overcomer is that love is a byproduct of their life. In 1 John 5, 2 through 3, a characteristic of an overcomer is that they are obedient. There is obedience in their lives. In 1 John 5, 19, there is a characteristic of an overcomer that we as Christians belong to God. And in 1 John 5, 20, Jesus himself guarantees all of these things for the overcomer. The idea of being an overcomer is an encouraging, powerful concept. It's powerful because it causes you to approach the battles of your life differently when you know that you are an overcomer and that the outcome is going to be okay. You go into battle differently. You approach temptation differently when you realize that you are in Christ and he has defeated the world system. Therefore, you can defeat the temptations that come your way because you're an overcomer. You're a victor. You approach your marital problems differently because you know that together you can defeat anything because husband, wife, you are overcomers and no problem can take your marriage apart because you are in Christ. You conduct your life with great confidence when you know that Jesus has overcome the world system and that you know you're in Christ. The result of all this, assurance. You move with confidence. You move through life differently. You know. You know. With certainty, you know. We know. Each of these statements for we know is followed by a significant principle or topic or truth that we are aware of and that we are certain of. Today, we jump in to 1 John chapter 5, And we look at the first of these we know principles and these we know statements, these we know assurances that we as Christians certainly need to have a handle on. Let's look at 1 John chapter 5, verses 2 through 5 together. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. This is love for God, to obey his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. The assurance I want to bring to you today, the we know that I want to bring to you today, is that we know we can obey God. You know today, you can know today that you can please God, that you can make God happy, that you have the power within you to please God and to obey God. It's such a frustrating thing when you're trying to please somebody who is unpleasable. It's such a tough thing that no matter what you do, you just can't make that person happy. One of my very first jobs was 
uh, in early high school, and I went to a lumber yard one day, and I asked this man for a job, and he said, no, I don't want you. And so I left, and I came back the next day, and I said, I'd like a job with you, and he said, no, I don't want you. And I came every day for four or five days, and on the fifth day, I said, look, mister, I want to work here. How about I just work for free for a month? And at the end of the month, you make a decision if I'm helping or not. He said, okay. So I worked for him. And every day he was angry with me. And every day he was grouchy with me. And every day he told me he didn't want me. And the 30th day came by. And I went into his office and I said, 30 days. I've given every day after school and all day Saturday, and here I am. I want to find out what you think. Am I a good employee? He said, I told you the first time I saw you, I don't want you. And I walked out, and that was the end of my employment at the lumberyard. (laughs) That guy was not fun to work for. I don't think I ever had a good day of work with him grouchy guy, couldn't make him happy. What a horrible way to go through life working for a guy like that. I'm glad I didn't get the job. Man, I'd be scarred today. Well, differently, different scars. You know you can obey God. You know you can please God. You know that God loves you and he's rooting for you and he's celebrating your victories and Jesus came and overcame the world so that you could be an overcomer and a victor with him. You can do this thing. John's gonna start out this fifth chapter with two key concepts being introduced. The first concept is love and the second concept is obedience. And he's going to start with some important reminders about relationship and love. Love. The objects of love he talks about first. Love is evident of our claim that we're a child of God. If you're a child of God, if you're a Christian person, then love is the byproduct. The reality of your claim that you're a Christian person is found in your love for others and your love for God. This is why those who have abandoned assembling together with others are missing it so badly. That's why those who say they have church on the river fishing are missing it so badly because you can never be a true Christian in isolation. You need people. You need other believers. We need each other. You need people you don't get along with very well to just rub up next to you every now and then. It really helps you be a Christian. (laughs) Our claims to be Christ followers and our claims to be a child of God are proven in our love for other people. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. 1 John 4, 7 and 8 says this. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. John picks up the same theme in verse 20, same chapter. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. Now, Friends, you know me. I would have said it way nicer than that. (laughs) I never would have put such a tough. But under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, John said, let me just tell you the truth here. If you say that you love God and you treat people with hatred, you don't treat them with love, you treat them with hatred. You're a liar. You don't love God. Because your love of God is proven in how you love people. For everyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Honestly, this isn't a very surprising concept for any of us who are believers because we find out that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Love is an evidence. It's a byproduct. It's an outward manifestation of a relationship with Jesus. That means that the external manifestation 
of an inward dedication and devotion to God is naturally love. Agape, unconditional love. Agape, I will just tell you, is much easier in isolation. But it's not the evidence. It's not the proof of the fact that your relationship with God is a reality. The second thing about love is the characteristics of love. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out His commands. Love's not a feeling. Love's a commitment. The Bible tells us this, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sin. Here, love in action. Love is a commitment to another person. Love doesn't gossip about somebody else's weaknesses. Love doesn't gossip about somebody else's flaws and faults. It covers their sin. It covers a multitude of sin. It just doesn't cover one problem. It just doesn't cover one argument. It just doesn't cover one issue. Love covers a multitude of sin. If I love you and you sin, I will rebuke your sin. I will cover your sin. I will forgive it. I will not publicize it. Love's practical. It's the kind of characteristic that always accompanies somebody whose life is an overcomer. In 1 John 5, 2, we learn that we know we love God by how we love each other. And in, first, or in John 13, we find out that the way that other people find out that we belong to Jesus is how we love one another. The way we love each other is a big deal to God and to this world that is watching our lives. You can't hate your brother and say you love God. And you can't love your brothers without loving God, and you can't love God without loving the brothers in Christ. Somebody would say, well, that's just circular reasoning. You're exactly right. Those two things feed off of each other and feed off of each other and feed off of each other. The second characteristic that John's going to cover is this topic of knowing that I can obey God. Obedience. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In this part of this book, John is going to tie together faith, and he's going to tie together love, and he's going to try to get obedience. He's going to put them all together. And I want to give you some characteristics of obedience. The Bible is not silent on my obedience to God. The Bible has many things to say about many characteristics of my obedience as it relates in my relationship with God. First of all, there's internal obedience, internal obedience. We love God when we keep his commands. God wants my obedience to be internally motivated, not externally motivated. What does that mean? God wants me to obey him out of love and not out of fear. God, I love you so much. You've been so good to me. How else could I act other than in complete obedience to you? Because you're so good to me, I want to be obedient to you. Not, I'm afraid if I don't obey, God's going to zap me. Those are different thoughts. And we want to be motivated, and God wants us to be motivated by an internal love for him, and that's why we obey him. Romans 6, 17 says this, but thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form, uh, uh, the, the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. Wholeheartedly. Their heart. These, Romans, uh, these Roman believers obeyed from their heart. It was an internally motivated thing. God isn't asking for you to live a life of surface superficiality in your obedience, where you put on a good show for everybody around you to look like you're obeying God. That doesn't please God. What pleases God is an internally motivated obedience out of my love for him, not just so I look like I'm obeying him so everybody else is fooled, but inside of me something has happened through a spirit of gratitude and a love for God that says, how else? God, could I ever act other than being obedient to you? The second thing, the second characteristic we find in Scripture 
about obedience is one of total obedience. Partial obedience does not satisfy God. Now, how many of you here this morning are parents? We should start a support group. <laughs> Hallelujah. There's a whole bunch of you that are just getting ready to have a child, your first child. Please, I beg you, sit down with one of these that have their hand in the air. Get some wisdom. Get some counsel. It's going to change your life having that kid. <laughs> I'm telling you. How many of you who are parents enjoy partial obedience? It's my favorite. I remember one day when my youngest son was working with me, working with me in the garage. And I gave him the job of sweeping up the dirt in the garage. And after he had finished sweeping up the garage, I knew he was done because the broom was laying on the floor and he was inside doing something else. And I found him and I brought him to the garage and I said, there is paper all over the floor. I told you to sweep the floor. He said, you told me to pick up the dirt. That's paper. Not responsible. The fact that I am a man of God has proven that he lived through that day. <laughs> Isn't it so nice to experience partial obedience from your child? God wants total obedience. Oh God, yes, I love you and I want to obey you, but it says here, as I see it, I know you authored it, but as I see it, I have found a loophole. You said dirt, not paper. Wow. Some people think that God grades on the curve. He doesn't. God doesn't compare you to how the person next to you is doing. God doesn't compare you to your spouse. God doesn't compare you to your father-in-law. God doesn't compare you to your mother-in-law. Too bad. <laughs> it isn't about buying God off with your obedience. I'll obey you, God, in three areas, and in exchange, you give me these two, and I'll do whatever I want. Joshua 22.5 says this, but be very careful to keep the commandment and the law that the Lord, the servant of the Lord, gave you, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to obey his commands, to hold fast to him, and to serve him with all your heart and all your soul. We're talking about total obedience and not partial obedience. The next characteristic about obedience that we find in Scripture is constant obedience. Now, this is obedience that isn't dictated by how you feel. It isn't dictated by your emotions. It's not dictated by your circumstances. It's not dictated by a bad day or a good day. Oh, God, I feel so good today. I can obey you. Oh, God, I'm having such a rough time right now. I just can't be obedient to you. I've got to do all kinds of other things to make myself feel good because I don't feel good. Constant obedience. In other words, not just when you feel like obeying God. But you obey God always, constantly, because he's God in your life. Joshua 22, 2 through 4, and he said to them, You have done all that Moses, a servant of the Lord, commanded, and you have obeyed me in everything I commanded. For a long time now, to this day, you have not deserted your brothers, but have carried out the mission the Lord your God gave you. Isn't that wonderful? We're talking about consistency. We're talking about constant obedience to God. And the last one is cheerful obedience. This one has to do with your attitude. This one has to do with an internal issue also, is the attitude that you choose to obey God. It says in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves an obedient giver? No. God loves a reluctant giver? No. God loves what kind of giver? Cheerful, Cheerful giver. Isn't that interesting? God's not just interested in the money. God's interested in the attitude. 
God wants you to be cheerful in your obedience. When somebody walks up to you and you look so miserable and they say, what's wrong with you? And you go, oh, I'm just obeying God. That doesn't help. <laughs> I'm a Christian, you know, can't you tell? Wow. Save us. There are three reasons, I think, that God can ask you to be cheerful in your obedience. First of all, if you fail, he forgives you. <laughs> Secondly, he'll never ask you to do something that he won't supply you the power to accomplish. You can be cheerful because whatever it is that God wants you to do, you have the power given to you by God to succeed at that. And we keep his commandments, number three, out of love and not fear. So you can have a great attitude. Philippians 4.4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. There's a little equation that I run in my life. I want to share it with you. Love plus obedience equals assurance. When I love God from my heart and I obey him from my heart, I am assured, I am secure. We know that we can please God. We know that we can obey God. We know that we can follow his commands. We know that we can adhere to his precepts. We know because we love and because we obey. And when we love and when we obey, the Bible says here that God's commands are not burdensome. And his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. In Matthew 11, Jesus said this, My yoke is easy and my burden is light. His commands are not burdensome when you love him from the heart and you obey him from the heart. Serving God, loving God, loving others is not designed to be a burden on you. Rather, a significant help in your life as an overcomer, a victor, a person who moves with certainty through a world that is surrounded and based on confusion. All because we know. We know that God loves us. We know that we can love each other. We know that we can please God. We know that we can obey God, and we know that his commands are not burdensome. We know, overcomer, we know. Bow your heads with me, please. He who overcomes belongs to God. He who overcomes belongs to God. He who overcomes has a relationship, a friendship, a belonging with God. Wow. Pastor John, at the very beginning of this service, talked a little bit in the introduction of our day about a personal relationship between you and a holy God. Today I talk to you about being an overcomer. Today I talk to you about moving through life with certainty and assurance, about things that you know when others are saying we just don't know. And the first step of all of this is having a personal relationship with Jesus, inviting Jesus into your life to forgive your sin and to be the Lord of your life so that you can obey him internally, totally, consistently, cheerfully. If you'd like to have a relationship with Jesus, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And I would invite you right where you sit to quietly repeat this prayer right after me. God will hear every word. And a change will take place in your life. A change that will take place today 
and will continue to take place all of your days. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, I know I've sinned, and I'm so glad that you're willing to forgive me. I ask you to come into my life to forgive my sin and to be the Lord and Savior of my life. Change me. Make me different. Help me. God, I want to be an overcomer. I want to love you. I want to love others. And I want to obey you. Thank you for hearing my prayer. 